Hello, everyone, and welcome to a session on new research on in inequity in the PSH system, scale, scope, and reasons for the return of Black residents to homelessness. Today's session will focus on findings from a new report from the California Policy Lab that examines why there are racial inequities in returns to homelessness or interim housing for Black PSH residents. We've partnered with California Policy Lab on a workshop in the past, and we're so pleased to collaborate with them again today. We'll leave time for questions at the end, so please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. And our featured speakers uh, were the co-authors of this report. We have with us today Janie Roundtree, Executive Director of California Policy Lab, and Dr. Norwida Milburn, Research Professor in Residence in the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA. As for a quick sponsor plug, SCAMF is proud to partner with the State of California's Time of Use Energy Campaign to remind all residents of affordable housing and SCAMF members that we can collectively ensure that our state uses more green energy by shifting energy use away from 4 to 9 p.m. I'll now turn it over to Ms. Roundtree and Dr. Milburn to kick off our session. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I believe Norwita is going to get us started today, and she may just need one second to share the presentation. But thank you so much for that introduction and for having us. Thank you. So thank you. We did a test of this, and it worked. And now I'm having difficulty sharing my screen. All right, let's see. Oops, I think it's me. It's me. There we go. I apologize. I'm old enough to say that I used to have problems with AV projectors way back when. So <laughs> this is not a surprise. So thank you for that introduction. Um, I want to say good afternoon. And we're going to be sharing a mixed, meth mixed methods study of um, permanent supportive housing in Los Angeles County. I want to acknowledge the other co-authors on this work, Earl Edwards and Dean Obermark. Um, this study um, that we're going to be discussing today was conducted in response to one of the um, areas for further research on homelessness that was requested by the LASA ad hoc committee on Black people experiencing homelessness. So this work really grows out of the work of that committee. I do want to acknowledge that uh, Jamie and I are part of a much larger team. And as I said before, the study used a mixed methods approach and we are dividing the work up today. Janie will present on the quant quantitative results and I will present on the qualitative results. We're gonna end with recommendations uh, that will be presented by Janie and then we will open it up for uh, questions and discussion. So um, Janie, do you wanna start? Um, great, thank you so much, Norita. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, we left at the opportunity to present these findings to housing developers and really look forward to your questions and ideas coming out of the presentation. Um, as Norita said, we are really focused on the experience of Black residents in particular in permanent supportive housing in Los Angeles. When the ad hoc committee met, they um, emphasized and were motivated by the statistic that Black people in our county represent 9% of the general population, yet comprise 40% of the homeless population. And that was really the driving question you know, around the ad hoc committee and our research as well, which is what is driving this huge disparity um, in people experiencing homelessness. One of the findings in that report indicated that once people are placed into permanent housing, Black residents are more likely to return to homelessness. And the committee really requested further research into this. So we're going to present some uh, much more detailed and rigorous data analysis that we did to make sure that we were still observing that disparity. And then the qualitative component will really start to unpack why that might be happening. 
Um, our major finding for the analysis, um, if you could go back to that slide, um, the one before that. The, the major finding of our analysis is that we estimate about 25% of Black residents re-experience homelessness and that Black residents in permanent supportive housing are 39% more likely to return to homelessness than white residents. Um, and you can advance to the next slide now, thanks. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the data that's informing this project. We were able to use um, roughly 10 years of data that we pulled from the Homeless Management Information System or the HMIS data countywide. Um, and the reason why this is so important is that a lot of studies of people's experience in permanent supportive housing are limited to a much smaller time period. And permanent supportive housing is meant to be a permanent housing placement and to really understand risk of falling out of housing or returning to homelessness, you need a much longer time period to look at any individual's trajectory through the system. And so our analysis really starts at the enrollment of any individual in the data and tracks that individual from that point on so that we observe whether they re-enroll in street outreach services or in interim housing, um, which is another name for the shelter system in the county. So that's what we're really looking at. After someone's enrolled in permanent housing, do they return to homelessness? Um, I wanna make a point about the qualitative data too on the, on the next slide, which is that um, we had relatively modest resources for this mixed methods project. And if you're at all familiar with research, interviews are the most resource and time intensive component of any research project. So um, I just wanna be really transparent that when we get to the qualitative findings, we would really describe this as exploratory analysis. We are pulling from extensive interviews and focus groups that reached 14 program managers, 11 case managers, and eight residents. So we are not trying to present this as a scientific study with a large countywide sample. Um, and, I, and I think that's important to understand. There's other information here around and in our report around what that sample looked like in the breakdown between tenant and, and scattered site, male, female, um, and different identity groups. Um, I did wanna say that these, these subjects for our interviews were pulled from both providers or PSH sites that had large racial disparities in uh, tenant outcomes and also ones that had um, low disparities in tenant outcomes. So we were really trying to understand the experiences of both um, sides of the spectrum. Next data or next slide, please. So this is just a little bit about um, our sample and the outcomes. So we were looking at about 16,000 unique individuals who've been enrolled in permanent supportive housing. You can see that the vast majority of them were black tenants, about 8,200. Um, and you can see the return um, percentage at 25%, which I described um, earlier, which is about 39% higher than the return rate for white residents in permanent supportive housing. Um, and then we provide some data on other groups as well. Um, several other groups, particularly American Indian or Alaska Native, also had high return rates, although not as high as Black residents but the number of residents who fall into that category that we observe in the data is quite small. It's only 131. Um, so we need to be a little careful about comparing um, those two numbers when you have groups of, of very different sizes. Next slide, please. This is a figure that I wanted to include um, specifically for this audience to make the um, the number of different permanent supportive housing developments that were in the data a little bit more transparent. And, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of statistics and then I'll describe what you're looking at on this, on this plot. So we were able to look at 321 unique permanent supportive housing projects in the data. So these are housing uh, sites that, that tenants might be enrolled in. So there are 321 countywide 63% of them were single site projects and 31% were tenant based and about 4% were multi-site or scattered site um, projects. Um, only about 11% of the programs in the sample were serving large numbers of tenants um, and, and by far the majority of them were serving roughly 50 or fewer tenants in any particular site at a given time. 
Um, and then this plot shows you the variation in racial disparities. And when I talk about racial disparities, I'm talking about disparities in the rates at which tenants return to homelessness, fall out of housing, um, and then show back up either in street outreach or, or interim housing. Um, and below the diagonal line, those are projects that have a greater return rate for Black residents. And above the line, you have a greater return rate for right, white residents. And if the dot is clustered along the line, it means there was very little difference on average between tenants' um, return rates by, by those two identity groups. So you can see based on this plot, there's a lot of variation. Um, and this is going to be really important for one of our qualitative findings that um, we see some structural effects um, that are driving the disparity. So it's, it's not the case when we talk about the aggregate data that every single program looks the same or has the same issues. Um, but what we're talking about is countywide people's experience overall, we're detecting a disparity. And when we wanted to turn to interviews to ask the question, why might that be happening? Um, I just wanted to repeat that we were doing these interviews within providers and PSH sites that had large disparities, as well as those that had um, very small or no disparities. So with that um, background on the data, I'm gonna turn the, the presentation back over to Dr. Milburn to talk about the qualitative findings. So um, thank you, Janie, for that framing and for really um, reminding everyone that the qualitative data are based on a relatively small sample and the data that we're reporting on, we really view as exploratory. Um, the reason that we did the qualitative work was to really try to do a deeper dive to really understanding um, the factors that contribute to Black residents falling out of permanent supportive housing and returning to homelessness. And just again, a reminder, we did this qualitative work via interviews with um, program managers case managers and former residents. So what we found overall was that there's really a, what we call a constellation of kind of interacting factors that um, are operating at different stages of the permanent supportive housing um, process that um, residents navigate. So, and all of these factors are making um, a contribution to um, why Black residents are falling out of housing and returning to homelessness. So these, the, these factors are kind of organized uh, around issues before or during the enrollment in permanent supportive housing and the search for housing. Then another area is obstacles encountered while housed in permanent supportive housing. And the next area for this, these factors are challenges encountered during transitions from permanent supportive housing and after exiting permanent supportive housing. And um, I going to kind of present overall findings. And then within the overall findings, I will be sharing some um, actual, um, some of the qualitative results. So overall for enrollment in permanent supportive housing um, and the search for housing, we found that bureaucratic processes and structures um, respond to reinforce, um, respond to and reinforce racial segregation. We also found that housing discrimination as and resident steering had occurred and that permanent supportive housing programs vary widely. Not all residents view permanent supportive housing as a permanent housing solution. So what I'm going to do um, for the rest of this presentation of a qualitative um, results is I'm going to share a few quotes from um, case managers um, and former residents to really um, help illustrate the qualitative findings. And I'm going to be talking about some of the factors, but not all of the factors. So for example, when we look at um, bureaucratic processes and how structures respond to and reinforce a racial segregation, here's um, what we heard from a case manager. We only service mostly SPA 6. We get most of our clients 
Environmental Health Agency. So that's where we're kind of stuck with SPA 6. When we um, look at housing discrimination and resident steering, what we hear from a case manager is that racial discrimination in the housing market is almost like an unwritten definition. So when there's a challenge, we can address it by reporting it to the housing authority and start up that process. We should take the time reporting, but it's just too time consuming. We just got to go on to the next one. And what we hear from former residents when um, and when residents um, talk about how they view uh, permanent supportive housing, not all residents view permanent supportive housing as a permanent, permanent housing solution. So what we heard from a former resident was, this is not where I want to be. I look at it more as a stepping stone and not permanent. This is not where I'm going to land. So I was looking forward to that two-year mark. I looked at it like, just settle down here for two years and then bounce. So when we looked at kind of the constellation of factors around obstacles within permanent supportive housing, this included the lack of safety and security, case management turnover and inconsistency, the lack of opportunities for growth and independence, and the pathologizing and racist treatment of Black residents. So what we heard, for example, from a former resident around uh, safety and security, um, the resident noted, I would be scared leaving my apartment and scared coming to a my apartment. As I'm getting ready to walk out of the door, I get all of my PTSD, anxiety, and adrenaline just to leave my house. And as I'm pulling up to park on the street or whatever, I get the same thing because this guy was staying literally right there whenever I came home. I spent three years scared of this guy. When we look at case management turnover, what we hear from case managers, uh, for example, is it takes time for people to warm up to you. So I would say it probably takes at least six months before you really effectively know your clients and they know you super well. And I think most people don't even last that long. And that's discouraging for clients for sure to open up, to build trust with someone, whatever. And they just disappear, disappear. When we look at um, the lack of opportunities for growth and independence, um, what we hear from a case manager is there seems to be a lack of that next step and that kind of keeping people here. And that to me is I think problematic because then maybe someone who is eight years sober, but there's new people coming in off the streets all the time. And it could cause people to slip up and maybe get involved in stuff and they shouldn't have, and that can kind of derail them. And what we hear uh, from a former resident as an example of the pathologizing and racist treatment is that she notes they're prejudiced. They don't know how to talk to you. And we're seen as drug addicts, we're seen as mental, we're seen as lazy baby getters. They don't see us. We also found that uh, transitions and exits from permanent supportive housing were challenging, including the lack of support uh, to transition out of permanent supportive housing, the loss of supports once residents had exited permanent supportive housing, and um, having to navigate a structurally racist housing market and society. So um, for example, with the lack of preparation to transition out of permanent supportive housing, a former resident shared, I wished at first they would have prepared me for things after permanent supportive housing, because in permanent supportive housing, there's no preparing. 
And if you don't know how to do it, you're messed up. For loss of supports once residents had exited permanent supportive housing, a former resident noted, that's the thing. No one from permanent supportive housing has asked me anything about if I'm okay. They still don't know that my move-in deposit hasn't been paid. When we um, heard from um, residents about navigating a structurally racist housing market in society, um, one resident said, most of the places that take section eight are right here in the ghetto if you want to live in LA. So we're really sharing these quotes. These are not all of the quotes. We did pick some quotes to support some of the findings that we're discussing today. But what we are sharing with you is really how this qualitative piece really allows us to hear the voices, both of uh, case managers as well as residents about what their experiences are in this system to help begin to um, more fully understand some of what the factors are that are contributing to the disproportionate exiting that we see. As we've said, this is really exploratory work. It's work that needs to um, be confirmed with a larger study that's not exploratory. But um, what we think that is exciting about these findings and really also allows us as researchers to really, to really be responsive to some of the concerns of the ad hoc committee is that it really allows us to bring the voices and experiences in particular of former residents into discussing um, um, what is going on and beginning to understand what's going on within uh, permanent supportive housing. So, and I'm sharing that really as I do mixed methods work but I'm much more of a quantitative researcher, but just um, I think the richness of this data and some of the opportunities that it affords us has been really exciting. I'm gonna turn this over to Jamie, who's going to share the recommendations that have evolved from both the quantitative and qualitative findings. And Janie, I will try to be a little less flaky advancing the slides. <laughs> this is not my strong suit, so. <laughs> No, no problem at all. Um, before I talk about the content on this slide, I just wanted to answer the question in the Q&A, which was what is what do we mean when we say return rate? Um, and it's simply just the percentage of residents in PSH that um, leave PSH and return to homelessness. So when we say 25% of Black residents returned to homelessness, it means that they left their permanent supportive housing and not only left the housing, but um, re-enrolled at some point in the future in street outreach services, which means they were unsheltered or um, that they entered uh, the interim housing system, which is, is um, shelter. So that's what we mean by return rate. It's just the percentage of people who have that outcome. Um, so we were, uh, we were gonna talk about the policy recommendations and I'm gonna give Norita a moment to to pull that back up, but um, but I can certainly begin to talk about them in the meantime. Um, All right, so I'm, Jenny, I'm having technical difficulty. I've got to figure out what's going on. So I'm oh, gonna, okay. I'll try to yeah. pull it up. Yep. No problem. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, not at all. So one, one thing I wanted to start with is that we, we made the recommendation that the system, meaning the coordinated entry system, should really differentiate between different types of permanent supportive housing and recognize that residents view some types of permanent supportive housing more as a temporary housing placement or a stepping stone. Um, and we don't mean to suggest that those types of housing are not valuable. They play a really important role, I think, in the ecosystem of housing. It's more that you shouldn't expect to see the same outcomes um, or retention rates in those types of housing than you would, for example, in a, a tenant-based Section 8 apartment where the tenant has a lot more autonomy um, and freedom to live their life. So um, I think this is particularly important in the context of thinking about performance metrics and or performance-based contracting. 
um, in the sense that you would not want to um, hold a, a property manager, for example, or a service provider to the same types of outcomes if they are running um, a PSH site that might have single room occupancy or shared kitchen facilities or other shared living arrangements where the residents do see their goal as moving out of that, that housing, right? So, um, so I think that that's one thing that we recommended to LASA and others that they, that they acknowledge that in the way that they think about the data that they're collecting and that they try to differentiate or distinguish between different types of permanent supportive housing when people are doing research or measuring um, tenant outcomes. Um, so I think that covers the first and, and second recommendation, which is acknowledge that that's the case and then create a plan for tracking information differently that's, that's more differentiated. Um, thirdly, we had a recommendation to address implicit bias, prejudice, and discrimination that exists among case managers, property managers, um, and in some cases, landlords. We, in the report, explicitly refer back to the extensive work done by the ADCOC Committee on People Experiencing Homelessness in making recommendations about how to think about bias and prejudice. Um, Dr. Milburn and I are not experts in this field. I think we mostly wanted to acknowledge that this is part of what's happening here, that people have experiences that they are reporting, at least in our exploratory analysis, um, that touches on these types of, of dynamics. And um, housing navigators, the people responsible for placing a tenant into housing, face these realities every day where they want to place uh, tenants at, into units as quickly as possible. But they might be thinking, you know, I don't want to waste time sending this person to this landlord knowing that they're going to get rejected out of hand. Um, you know, that, that needs to be solved, um, you know, at, at a societal level. And I think many of these issues are what drive people into homelessness in the first place, that they're experiencing discrimination in the housing market. Um, another recommendation is to fund 24-hour services to enhance safety in the buildings. This did come up in, in several interviews. Um, and uh, I'd be curious, certainly, if this audience, um, if this resonates, or if you have ideas or want to react to this. Um, I don't think that it was necessarily a request to have law enforcement officers in these buildings. Um, there are many other options for um, having people who can de-escalate conflicts, who can resolve issues with tenants, um, and who can be there for the purpose of creating a sense of safety in the building, um, and that that resource would be different than your service provider, who is, um, for example, a case manager or an intensive uh, case manager working um, for individual tenants. A big issue right now in the system is capacity to staff the service providers. Service providers are um, really at a crisis right now in terms of finding people who will work um, in these positions. Um, and there is quite a high turnover of case managers. I think it's a, a very difficult job. There's, it's low paying and there's a lot of competition between providers to attract qualified case managers um, to other organizations. And so we've presented this finding to multiple system leads to, um, to really focus on a, a couple of things to reduce case management turnover. One is professionalizing that position. Right now it's seen as a position where um, there isn't a professional future. So if you're successful and want to earn more money, you're gonna leave the case management profession and move up in your organization. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And, and if we value what those people do, they should be, there should be opportunities for promotion and, and earning other money within the case management role. Um, and, and reducing this competition through, um, through salaries. And, and, and I think, you know, I don't have a magic solution to this, but we've got to address the labor market issue. We have to find ways to attract more people to these positions and um, help them feel supported and that they have the resources, whether it's mental health care or other, to do what's a very difficult and challenging job. Um, we recommended that the county consider piloting a peer advocate program and testing whether it's an effective model. Um, we didn't go so far as to say this is evidence-based, but we did hear from um, interviewees that having a peer who had been through this experience, who had navigated the system, who may have experienced homelessness, um, would be a particularly powerful advocate. 
Um, and so we recommended someone think about how to design and test a peer advocacy program. Um, and then there's this idea of providing sustained services to support transitions to independent housing after exit. So this really requires acknowledging that permanent housing, permanent supportive housing often is not permanent. And we need to plan for residents seeking um, other types of housing and sort of graduating out of highly supportive or restrictive environments into other types of housing. And if those transitions are moments where people are at high risk of falling out of housing altogether or in returning to homelessness, what would it look like to support that type of transition more proactively so that people are not at high risk of, um, of leaving permanent supportive housing and ending back on the street. Um, Norita, could you go to the last slide? Um, these are just some thoughts we had for this audience. Um, specifically, these are not recommendations in the report, and I don't want to suggest that everyone on the research team has vetted these, um, but I did want to um, share them. And in particular, we have some staff on the research team who either work with or have spoken to property developers such as yourselves and, and, and try to think from your perspective um, what might be valuable from this set of research findings. So I think one common sense point is to monitor retention and, and make it something that is a part of the conversation um, and part of your own sense of performance or performance metrics within the development and, and with a focus on equity. Are, you know, are tenants of different racial ethnic groups having similar or different experiences in the building? Um, one way to take more specific action on that would be to build retention goals into contracts that you have with property managers or service providers working in your building. The, the role of the property manager is, is really critical here because they have so much um, contact with tenants and, and a lot of decision making will go on around conflict resolution, how to handle tenants who are in crisis and who are difficult and or disruptive to other tenants. Um, how a property manager reacts to that is really important. Um, and um, signaling that retaining the tenant is important might um, open up alternative pathways beyond just um, uh, the eviction processes, which sort of gets into the third point here, which is um, how do you develop problem solving and supportive mechanisms and conflict de-escalation uh, that doesn't automatically uh, uh, defer to starting the eviction process? You know, are there other ways of handling um, the situation? Um, and then for, for those of you or, or anyone in the system who is actually uh, managing a mixed property portfolio, um, that could be a great opportunity to think about these transitions from the more supportive housing model into the more independent housing model and, and sort of knowing that you might have tenants in one that are seeking opportunities in the other um, and, and sort of thinking more strategically about that. And, and maybe some of you already do that. And um, if so, we'd love to, to hear more about that. Um, so that is the, the full presentation. Um, and I can see that there are questions in the Q&A. Um, so Alan, I don't know if you're, Norita and I can take a look at them, but, but if you have ones that you'd like to read to us, we're happy to start the discussion portion. Uh, thanks, Janie. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of bureaucracy, but I think that these are pretty straightforward and they all seem like they're pretty good. So I think if you want to just handle them in turn, I can step out of the way. Sure. That work? So, so the first question is, will there be more exploratory work for scattered site PSH clients? Uh, we did include scattered sites in the study. Um, and the, to my knowledge, there isn't research um, funded currently that would collect mm -hmm. data specifically in scattered sites, although I certainly wouldn't want to speak for every researcher out there. There, there are probably research projects ongoing that Norwita and I are unaware of. But on this specific issue where we're centering the experience of Black residents and examining um, why they might be at higher risk of returning to homelessness, I'm not aware of any other research ongoing. Is that right, Norwita? I would agree. I'm I'm not aware of any. Um, so the next the next question is, how would you differentiate permanent supportive housing with interim housing in this case, especially considering interim housing is available but isn't fully occupied, mostly congregate interim housing? So just to clarify, um, the 
interim housing projects in LA County were not part of the study at right. all. We were only looking at the experience of tenants of permanent supportive housing. The reason why we keep mentioning interim housing is that a future enrollment in interim housing is a signal that that person is homeless, despite the fact that they had an enrollment in PSH. So for every all 16,000 individuals in the data set, we started their journey at the moment that they enrolled in permanent supportive housing. Um, and, and it's limited to permanent supportive housing. But then we look at their individual trajectories and some people stayed in permanent supportive housing. Some people left permanent supportive housing and no one ever heard from them again. We can't make any real statements about what happened to them. They may have left and moved in with family or left the state. You know, it's hard to say in the absence of any information. But we did see this phenomenon where people enrolled in permanent supportive housing. Um, we could either see them leaving or not, but we definitely see them enrolling in shelter. Um, in the future or in street outreach services. And it's, it's a very strong, clear indication that they not only left their permanent housing unit, but they are a homeless again. Um, and if you think about it, having 25% of black residents experience that outcome is really disturbing. Um, you know, we, we shouldn't, as a system, we shouldn't accept that that's uh, what what happens uh, to people that we've gone to the trouble of placing into housing. And so that that's really at the core of what we're trying to figure out is why is that happening for anyone, but particularly why is it happening more frequently um, to Black residents of PSH? Um, and then the final question that we have so far is, can you expound on the peer advocate program idea? Norita, do you want to take that one? So the peer advocate program really is something that was raised by former residents. One of the things that former residents point out is that people who have the lived experience of homelessness really um, understand um, what, that, um, what that process is like. They understand um, you know, what it's like to be on the streets. They also understand what it's like to um, move off the streets into housing. They um, understand uh, some of the strengths that people bring, um, as well as the challenges that people have. Um, some who have challenges around substance use, um, some who have challenges around mental illness. But one of the things that um, former residents pointed out when we um, in talking about some of the um, uh, dehumanization that they experienced, the pathologizing that they experienced there, they reported that they thought if there were peer advocates who were part of this process, those peer advocates would be less inclined to respond to um, other homeless people in that way. So, and, and they also saw this, uh, the peer advocate as really a, a way for people to um, continue to grow out of homelessness. And it would also create a pipeline to increase the number of case managers who um, had lived experience themselves and would be able to better connect to. Um, other people with lived experience. So this really grew out of the, um, the, the what was reported by, um, by former residents. Uh, we don't have any other questions, at least that I see. Um, people should feel free to write in their comments and reactions. Um, you know, I'd love to know if any of the recommendations resonated or if you feel like they would be helpful to you as a developer, um, or if um, more importantly and more interestingly, if any of them seem um, off base to you given your, your experiences. We always welcome that kind of feedback. Uh, we have a question, were there any surprises for you all in the research? Norita, do you want to start? I, 
I think one surprise um, was that I, though I think we expected it from the ad hoc committee, I think one surprise was the reporting of the um, um, some of the, the steering that occurred with residents and some of the reporting of uh, discrimination um, that both case managers reporting on some of the steering that was occurring and then residents reporting on the discrimination that they'd experienced. That was one surprise in the finding. I think another really important surprise in the findings was that many re former residents did not see permanent supportive housing as the end, that they saw it as a step and that they really wanted to um, have Section 8 housing and saw permanent supportive housing as a way of moving to Section 8 housing. And I think for those of us who've been in the homelessness arena for quite a while, we have seen permanent supportive housing as kind of an end to homelessness, and former residents did not have that same perspective. So I think those were two findings that were most surprising to me. What about you, Janie? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um... I guess I'll, I'll start by um, being contrarian and saying one thing that I didn't find surprising and then I'll, then I'll, then I'll answer the actual question. But um, having worked in other contexts on examining the mechanisms behind dis disparate outcomes, particularly outcomes that, that where there are big disparities by racial or ethnic group, one thing that I've found pretty consistent to, to be the case is that there's a structure in place that creates this as an unintended consequence, that, that people are going about their jobs in the way that they're told to do them within a system. And that system creates a mechanism by which groups of people have a worse outcome. And in this case, um, it feels really important to acknowledge that uh, this is a really large county and that there are probably whole groups of tenants that are accessing permanent supportive housing where they are experiencing homelessness and where they are and or where they are being served. And that um, just purely by geography, some groups are, are placed into certain types of housing um, that you know where, where there are maybe fewer services funded, uh, where communities have been disinvested, where um, the, the housing themselves might be more of this um, uh, less permanent type housing that we talked about during the, the conversation. And I, and I don't, we can't tease out what is the bigger driver of the disparity, but that's clearly part of it. Um, and, and I think it's so important to acknowledge that, that uh, reducing racial disparities often involves sort of the courage and conviction to look at an entire system and how it's organized um, and not just assume the status quo is okay. Um, and so I, I think that's something that um, I expected to see and it, it always looks a little, a little different. And I think the key is that many of these consequences are unintended. Not every person working in the system is engineering it to have that outcome. It's just what happens. And if you don't pay attention and don't reverse it, um, it can continue. Um, I think the thing that that surprised me or, or that I didn't think about before do, doing this work were the safety concerns that many mm -hmm. residents feel um, and uh, the sort of practical solution that they were calling for to have better security services. Um, and, and, you know, uh, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised by that, but, but I thought it was um, another interesting finding. Um, so it looks like we're getting some more questions here. Is the term permanent supportive housing flawed? I'm wondering if calling it permanent is not reflective of the fact that it's potentially not permanent. Um, I, I think that's a really great question. And I would also, um, I think, wonder whether all PSH is supportive, <laughs> um, either permanent or supportive. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think that, that, that there could be a more accurate and more nuanced typology of housing that might acknowledge some of those differences where you're going to have certain types of housing with very little funded services for the tenants and others where there's really robust services potentially funded by the healthcare system, um, as well as being more or less permanent. I don't, I don't know, Norita, what do you think? I would agree, Jenny. I think that the um, when we talk about the high housing typologies, so we are also 
don't always take into account the diversity that exists among people with lived experience of homelessness as well. Um, and I, I think permanent is probably a misnomer. And I think supportive is also a misnomer, as you've said. I think that there could be a better match of housing to the needs of um, people we see on the streets. That would be one way of approaching homelessness. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a great question around housing discrimination. I'll just uh, read it for you, Norita. Related to discrimination on the housing market from landlords, my experience as a housing locator showed me that a lot of landlords either are unaware of SB 329, which prohibits discrimination based on source of income, meaning that properties anywhere in the city, not exclusively in lower income areas or the ghetto, or B, wield minimum credit score thresholds, application fees, and income requirements to preemptively make it next to impossible for lower income and formerly unhoused people to find a unit. Was your team able to develop more specific recommendations to tackle housing discrimination for Black former PSH residents that return to homelessness? Um, so, so the short answer to your question is no, our report does not go into that type of detail, and we are not um, experts really in developing that type of policy recommendation. Um, we hope that this report will prompt a conversation around people who do have more experience with this. And I think this is a particularly an issue where legal advocacy is crucial. Um, uh, there are mechanisms for testing housing discrimination through blind tenant shopping. Um, there are litigation strategies, you know, there are really important sort of known mechanisms, um, but we didn't feel that we really had the expertise to go into too much detail in, in the research report. Um, but certainly uh, what you're saying is consistent with our findings and, and we do hope that, that people with more expertise will pick up the thread um, and talk about sort of concrete reactions to this. I, um, I, would, I yeah. would also think in picking up the thread because I do agree, this is not our area of expertise. Um, but I, in picking up this thread, as we've recommended in the report, doing it in parallel with the recommendations of the ad hoc committee, because the ad hoc committee did make some more specific recommendations um, that I think are more legally based and um, address the points that were raised in this question. They went into much more detail in the ad hoc committee than we did. So we have, um, these are all really great questions. We have one um, about the 25% return rate. Does it cover the universe of people who return to homelessness or just the people who seek help again? Um, this is such an important question and it relates really <laughs> to the limitation of administrative data, particularly in Los Angeles. But you are right that we are measuring returns to homelessness in the way that we observe it, which is a re-enrollment in services. So these are people experiencing homelessness who are um, either enrolled in a program or seek help. And you're absolutely right that it would exclude anyone that we can't see at all in the data. And, and so I think one way to think about the 25% return rate or any of the return rates that we reported is that they are a lower bound estimate, meaning it is the minimum number of people experiencing homelessness and there are likely to be many more that we don't see. This is true for every research project and data analysis in Los Angeles, there's a, because we have such a large unsheltered population, many of whom are disconnected from services, anytime you're working with the HMIS data, you're really looking at the population of homeless people or people experiencing homelessness that are being served. Um, and you're not looking at the, the whole population. So um, uh, we, we still do work because we want to put information out and we think it's important to measure these things, but it's such an important question and I appreciate you asking it and, and giving us a chance to explain that. Um, the next question is caseworkers are discriminating against disabled and denying extensions. I didn't get the help I usually got and now I've been terminated. I have so much going on and it's overwhelming. I was denied by every organization I contacted for help. Who can handle section eight problems? Also, it makes it worse when things change on a daily basis. Um, well, first, thank you for sharing that. And I'm so sorry to hear about um, your troubles. I, I wish that I had a good answer for you. I'm definitely not an expert on um, Section 8 tenants and, their, and the services provided or legal mechanisms. Um, 
uh, Norita, if that's also true for you, maybe we can ask the rest of the audience to try to chime in with a potential solution for Ms. For Ms. Guzman. But Norita, did you have anything? I don't, and I think that's a good alternative to see if there are people in the audience who can help. Um, so the next question is, um, I arrived 10 minutes late, so apologies for, for lab, but does the lab provide technical assistance to help housing programs incorporate best practices into our policies? Um, it's a great question. I didn't, we didn't include an explainer of what the California Policy Lab is, so I'll, I'll do that now and then I'll answer your question. Um, we are a research center based at UCLA and we have a site at UC Berkeley and we work on um, uh, quantity, primarily quantitative data analysis and program evaluation. Um, and the UCLA site has a strong focus on homelessness, um, but we also work on criminal justice reform, education, labor market dynamics and unemployment, poverty and access to safety net programs like general relief, um, TANF or uh, CalFresh, which is food assistance, um, and one of the reasons why we work across these bigger issue areas is that we're really focused on people and impacts. And so if you wanna understand why a person, for example, um, is experiencing homelessness and what's happened to them, you really have to understand all of the institutions that affect their lives, whether it's the criminal justice system or mental health services or the emergency rooms department. Um, so a lot of what the California Policy Lab is doing is linking data together to try to build a more holistic picture of what's happening either in LA County or in some cases at the state level. Um, and we have a lot of different faculty affiliates like Dr. Milburn and others who lead research projects for us. Most of our research partnerships are with public agencies. So we work with the LA County Homeless Initiative, the LA County Department of um, Health Services, Housing for Health Program, the LA County Department of Mental Health and LASA, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority and others on research, long-term research agendas focused on homelessness. Um, we, we typically don't partner with um, nonprofit organizations, although we are advised by them and have community advisory boards for, um, I'm sorry about my cat, um, for many of our, of our projects. So, uh, so the short answer to your question is that unfortunately we typically can't offer technical assistance um, to housing developers, but we are always willing, especially given this project, to talk to people offline and have more informal conversations around what we're learning and what best practices might be. Um, and to the extent we can, we'd be happy to connect people to other organizations um, working in that space. Um, okay. How was PSH determined? Was it via coordinated entry or other systems, um, i.e. high utilizers of systems like the Denver Social Impact Bond or a combination? I think there's also a disparity here in many cases. Um, so if the question is how people are placed into permanent supportive housing, um, I think that's a fascinating question. And coincidentally, Norwita and I are both on a larger research team that is looking at the triage tools or surveys that are used to prioritize people for different types of housing. Um, and in Los Angeles, they're using for single adults, the VI SPDAT tool. Many of you I'm sure are familiar with that. And, and our research is focused on whether that is in fact an accurate measure of vulnerability and whether the VI SPDAT could be more precise at predicting vulnerability and or more equitable in the way it measures vulnerability across different racial and ethnic groups in particular. So in a completely separate context, we're really focused on, on that question. The, the way that it works in Los Angeles now is that typically someone will take the VI spit out assessment, they'll be given a score, and if they score over a certain threshold, they are put in the queue for placement into permanent supportive housing. Then um, different policies can prioritize and or rank order among that list of people who uh, are eligible for permanent supportive housing. Um, and the um, uh, then, you know, once you're prioritized for permanent supportive housing, you go into the matching process. Um, and that's where the housing navigator, housing locator is working with 
the landlord, they're trying to match the open resource to the client. Um, it can be a complex and time consuming process. You need to make sure the tenant obviously has the documents that are required to be in place. And also some properties, as you all know better than anyone, have very specific funding requirements. So they're trying to match people who um, have those characteristics that are funded for that for that unit, you know, a classic example might be that certain housing units are set aside for veterans. You need to make sure you have um, a veteran in your queue. So um, it's a fairly layered, complex process, and we we do see quite a few people in Los Angeles being placed in permanent supportive housing with low scores on the vulnerability assessment. Most of them have high scores, but we see a, a fairly large number of people with low scores who are nonetheless prioritized. Um, uh, either for policy reasons or through the matching process um, and accessing units. Um, and there was a, a question that I just saw in the chat about when you can see the research that I described on the VSPDOT. Um, and it's, we're very much in the middle of that. So we don't anticipate publications um, coming out soon, but, um, but there will be a lot of rollout when there are findings that can be shared publicly. Um, so hopefully people will have access to that as, as soon as it's, it's possible to do so. Um, okay, were RSOs considered PSH? What percent of residents and RSOs left into homelessness? RSO is not a PSH solution. They are okay for interim, not PSH as program participants have shared. Um, I'm not familiar with the acronym RSO. I, I, I wasn't, I was trying to figure that acronym out. Unless it's, is it, um, is it I'm SROs sorry. or it's is rinse, it different? It's rent control. Uh, rent stabilized. Oh, rent stabilized. Okay. That is one I don't know. I don't, I don't think it would be considered PSH unless it is a PSH unit, meaning it's a project-based property for, for this population or a scattered site uh, voucher situation. So I don't think categorically rent stabilized units are okay. SROs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Mean SRO. Thank you. Oh, that, SRO. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Yes. yes. And, and the, the answer is that SROs were included in the study. And I, and I think Norita and I are quite to agree with you that they should be probably treated as a separate category. Um, Norita, mm -hmm. do you want to follow up on that? I would just um, say, I agree. I think it should be a separate category. I mean, I think part of what is coming out is in this discussion that we did discover that wasn't totally a surprise, but it's in the findings is really getting, there's so much variation in what is considered PSH or permanent supportive housing in Los Angeles County. It's just, it's, um, it's not um, easily described in a lot of different types of housing seem to fall in that category. And we tried to do some categor categorization for research purposes, but it was still a bit complex. And one of our recommendations was perhaps there should be more attention given to really kind of um, providing a better descriptor description of what really encompasses permanent supportive housing. A typology would be helpful. So a long way of answering your question, yes, SROs were included. I don't think they should be included. Um, okay, as we get up to time, I'm gonna have to, gonna have to shut us down, but I wanna take a moment to thank uh, Janie Roundtree and Dr. Norita uh, Milburn for the presentation and the terrific work that you did today. Uh, I'll just say a couple of um, logistics issues. Uh, one is that we've been in, in touch with Ms. Guzman and somebody from staff here will be in touch with see if we can work her through the section eight question. Somebody else asked um, how can they uh, access the recording of the session and there will be a um, questionnaire, a survey that goes out after this um, that will have access and then we keep um, the YouTube videos of these sessions on our website too. Um, so with that, I think I'm just going to uh, reiterate my appreciation and say thank you and um, look forward to um, hearing more of, about the great work at, uh, at City Lab and, um, and, uh, and uh, did I just mess that up? And uh, 
look forward. And thank you again for your time. Well, thank you for allowing us to come and present and hey, share the you. findings. Yes, thank you so much all for your time and your really thoughtful, insightful questions. Um, I really enjoyed being here. We do have a newsletter. If you're interested in hearing um, any updates on our research on any topic, you can sign up for our newsletter at capolicylab.org. That's capolicylab.org. And I can, I can put that in the chat right now. Um, and we would uh, love to uh, hear from you. Um, and thanks again. Thanks again to the folks at uh, UCLA and California Policy Lab. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. Okay. Bye, thank you.